Well, thank you. It's good to be back with you. And uh, tonight, looking at the final of our instincts, our time together, the fifth one, apathy. Uh, I don't know if anyone here has ever experienced apathy about anything, but hopefully we find out tonight. I think most of us probably know that experience. I do want to begin in the similar way to the previous weeks, just to kind of recap and remind us. The way we've been talking about these instincts, we use C.S. Lewis's definition as behavior as if from knowledge. That all of us have, have ways, assumptions that we make, things that we may believe, instincts at work within us that lead us to behave in certain ways, to respond in certain ways, to act in certain ways that sometimes we can be unaware of. And uh, I often uh, give Pastor Jim credit when I say that we've been using this model from 1 Timothy, where Paul gave the advice to Timothy to keep a close watch on your life and the teaching. The part of what we do with our instincts is as we mature as believers, we become more aware of what is motivating our behavior, what, are, what those instincts are at work within us. And we develop the skill set through our faith, through the teaching, to check those things, to keep them in their proper place. Uh, I've pointed out throughout the weeks as we've been together, too, that these instincts are not necessarily sins. In the book, I write that these aren't the five expectations of men. You have to have these to qualify. Nor are they the five sins of men. You know, watch out for these things. As we talked about with ambition and reputation and even apathy today, um, these can be good things, appropriate things, things that are naturally a part of our life, but we can begin to blindly indulge them in such a way that they begin to drive our behavior, can even become desperation in our life and lead us into real disobedience. And uh, I think we'll see that tonight as we take a look at apathy and particularly the story of Abraham. Uh, like previous weeks, we're going to read a passage of Scripture, though it'll be a little bit in. So if you want to turn to Genesis chapter 21, we'll get there eventually. The five instincts take their uh, initial image from the work of Shakespeare. I laid that out the very first week we were together, his stages of a man. And when you get to this fifth stage, this is his description that I've associated with the word apathy. So the image of the man he describes is into the lean and slippered pantaloons, he's describing basically pajamas, <laughs> with spectacles on nose and pouch on side. One of my favorite phrases from the whole monologue, a world now too wide for his shrunk shank and his big manly voice turning again toward childish treble pipes and whistles in his sound. Well, there's a couple things I think are important about that image. You notice the first one is this voice beginning to shrink. Uh, he positions him, paints him as a man kind of knocking around the house in his slippers, in his pajamas, and his voice, the way he once engaged the world, has now with age begun to shrink. He no longer engages the world with the same volume, the same voice, which for Shakespeare is clearly a sign of his, a kind of analogy of his engagement with life itself. And then that line in the middle, that really at the heart of this, this experience he's having, is that the world has become too wide. The world now too wide. I love that phrase because I think it's something at some point we've all experienced and certainly at times can become a kind of instinct, a kind of way of living into the world. Shakespeare uses the image of a widening world and we actually have a scientific term that often gets used to describe this same experience. Perhaps you're familiar with the word entropy. It is the second law of thermodynamics. Pastor Jim will be coming up to do a presentation at some point, and you can lay out all the things I misrepresent uh, about it. But in my simple definition of entropy and thermodynamics, entropy is the idea that things do not naturally organize themselves. Things go from organized to unorganized. They go from order to chaos, that the longer you allow something to be, the more it will fall apart. It's true of just about everything from our own biology and bodies to the universe expanding, moving towards disorder. I think it's also true of the human experience of the way time passes and life is experienced. That in our younger days, life seems to make sense. We have ideals and beliefs and passions, but as the years begin to accumulate, as time goes by, we all begin to experience how hard it is to keep things together, how naturally things begin to complicate themselves and fall apart. Your life never seems to get simpler. Your life never seems to get more organized. If you stop paying attention or working on it, it immediately becomes unordered. It becomes chaotic. It's true of just about everything that we do, and we work hard as humans to try to put it all back together as much as possible. Our jobs and our chores and our fitness, our diet, our home remodels. So much of the energy of life is spent trying to reverse entropy, to keep things from decaying, to keep things from falling apart. So we maintain them and protect them and rebuild them. And I think the human experience of it is it's exhausting. 
Entropy takes its toll not just on creation, but on our energy as human beings and our ability to engage all of those complexities. For most of us, as we near the end of life and look back on a lifetime of that work, having mounted our best attempts to control it and to piece it all together and keep it together, as time goes by, we begin to understand how little of life can actually be controlled. The things that we thought we had nailed down, safe and secure, end up falling apart as well. Things we built no longer work. Your life's work might be erased by your replacement's decision on their first day. Problems you thought solved in youth all of a sudden reappear in midlife or late in life. Society grows more perplexing and frustrating. Relationships now seem to require more of you than you have to give to them. They give you less than they maybe once paid back. So the temptation, the instinct, is to begin to disengage it. We content ourselves with little hobbies and little enclaves where we can control life, little lives that we clutch and comforts that we can hold on to. There's a fairly famous book about the psychology of aging called Growing Old, and in it, the social scientists Elaine Cummings and William Earl Henry describe what they call a theory of social disengagement, that as we begin to age and as we begin to face the inevitability of death, we begin to disengage from relationships around us. Most people tend to have less relationships the longer they live. There's even some studies that suggest you may laugh less the longer that you live. I think all of that is what Shakespeare was trying to get at and describe when he used that phrase, the world now too wide. That the world has become too big and too complicated, all of the life experiences making it painfully obvious to me to go on believing that I have any really control at all. There's a famous scene in the novel, The Count of Monte Cristo. Uh, Edmond Dantes offers this toast. He's a young man offering a toast to another young man. And he says in front of this dinner room, life is a storm, my young friend. You will bask in the sunlight one moment and be shattered on the rocks the next. What makes you a man is what you do when that storm comes. You must look into that storm and shout, do your worst for I will do mine. Then the fates will know you as I know you, Albert Mondego, the man. I write in the book, that's a young man's game. And <laughs> nobody at the end of life is shouting into the storm, do your best to me. That's the sort of thing we do when we're in the adventure uh, instinct. The thing we do when we're young and we think we can take the world on and that our best days are before us. Throw the storm against us, throw everything you've got at us and we'll show you what we've got. Few of us can maintain that for very long. And eventually, as Shakespeare says, the voice begins to fail. The voice turns to whistles. Our ability to shout back into the storm diminishes as we realize how little control we actually have. I actually think you see this instinct of apathy all over the Bible. That tendency for both men but women as well to disengage and become apathetic towards challenges. There's certainly a moment of passivity in Adam as he takes the fruit from Eve doesn't mount any sort of defense or re reluctance. Noah, who was straight off the ark, having seen God's great miracle, what does he do? He gets drunk and passes out in his tent. David, you might remember in that moment of decision with Bathsheba, was lounging on his roof in the time when other kings went out to war. Barak, the great judge from the book of Judges, the leader of the army, couldn't muster up enough courage to go into battle without help. I think you even see it in places like Peter, where he is drawn to eat with Gentiles one moment, but then his controversy begins to form around it, reluctantly disengages from what he believes and slip back in to what, he had, what was acceptable and what he could control. But one of the places I think this instinct of apathy is strongest and most clearly on display is in the life of Abraham. And that might be a little bit of a surprise to you. If we went to Sunday school class, we all remember Abraham is the father of faith, the one who leaves home and sets out over horizons and follows God. He's the archetype of somebody of faith. How could you describe Abraham as somebody apathetic? His whole life seems to be driven by his willingness to leave, to go, to press on, to believe in all of the complexity of doing it. But his life was also more complicated than sometimes that Sunday school image leads us to believe. Those risks of travel led to threats, like the times that he was before the kings, powerful men, passing off his own wife as a sister and just trying to avoid the confrontation. 
the complexity of relationships with people like his nephew Lot, the way, though he interceded on Lot's behalf, that relationship was never restored or established, his own struggle with infertility and the promises of a son that seemed to not ever be fulfilling itself. At times, Abraham's faith is so obvious and clear and remarkable, it really genuinely is, and at other times, he struggles to actually go on believing and trusting, shouting into the storm, if you want to use the image. He lies to Pharaoh about the reality of his wife. He saves Lot, but finds himself unable to track him down and reconcile. Of course, he takes Hagar and produces a son outside of God's plan, only complicating the situation in his home. At one point after that event, whenever Sarah and Hagar became in conflict with one another, Hagar having given birth to Ishmael and Sarah still barren, Sarah came and said, Abraham, you have to do something about Hagar. Abraham's literal response was, you deal with it. He checks out altogether. And here, the great man of faith finds himself, I think, tired and exhausted of the whole thing and unable to engage the complexity within his own home. Now, that might not seem like a big thing, choosing the football game and the recliner over dealing with the complexity in the family, but it has devastating consequences. Genesis tells us that Sarah began to mistreat Hagar, and because of it, Hagar and Ishmael fled into the wilderness. When it comes to faith, many worry that doubt is the big enemy, the great obstacle. That if you're going to live a life of faith that stretches across all of the difficulties and challenges, the years, the decades, if you really want to keep that faith alive, the thing you have to watch out for is doubt. Well, there's certainly a sense of that being true. But I think scripture just as often, if not more, presents apathy as the great risk to faith. That to sustain faith over decades and years, what you really keep your eye on is a tendency to disengage and become apathetic. I think more men have lost the vitality of their faith to their obsessions of hobbies, the security of their recliners, than any of them have to grotesque sins or violence or doubt. C.S. Lewis wisely warned, murder is no better than cards if cards can do the trick. Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts, without complexity. We believe, but we disengage what we can't control. And as we grow older, we're more and more aware of how little we can control. I think it's one of the great challenges facing so many men today, and it's not just men that are in retirement age, but so many men. You look at the giant problem we're having in society of fathers disengaging and becoming apathetic to the responsibilities of fatherhood, the way men are increasingly dropping out of education and the workforce, how more men are choosing not to pursue relationships or marriage at all, and then of course, one of the stats we worry about so much, the disengagement of men from church. Study after study shows that women not only show up on Sundays more than men, but they pray more than men, they read their Bibles more than men, and describe their faith as important to them more than men. Just about everywhere and across all ages, you find men dropping out and disengaging, choosing apathy. Um, there's a great book, some of you like when I make book recommendations, you tell me afterwards, I wrote that one down. One of my favorite books, it's a little bit older, but it's a book uh, by a gentleman named Neil Postman, Amusing Ourselves to Death. Kind of a classic if you haven't read it. Not a Christian book, he's looking at society and culture, particularly how media has impacted culture. And he explained that there's these two dystopian views of the future. Again, we are not looking at scripture interpretations, we're looking at sci-fi dystopian views of what will go wrong in society. Those two views, he articulates, are characterized by two famous novels. George Orwell's 1984, maybe you've heard of it, or Aldous Huxley's A Brave New World. In Orwell's 1984, the author imagines an authoritarian government that is obsessed with controlling people, controlling society through power. But in Huxley's A Brave New World, he instead imagines this dystopian future as citizens so obsessed with pleasure and appetite that they're controlled by it. So Postman writes this, what Orwell feared were those who would ban books. What Huxley feared was that there would be no need to ban a book, for there would be no one who wanted to read one. Orwell feared those who would deprive us of information. Huxley feared those who would give us so much that we would be reduced to passivity and egoism. 
or well feared that the truth would be concealed from us. Huxley feared the truth would be drowned in a sea of irrelevance. Orwell feared we would become a captive culture. Huxley feared that we would become a trivial culture. In 1984, people are controlled by inflicting pain. In a brave new world, they are controlled by inflicting pleasure. In short, Orwell feared that, we, that, feared that what we hate will ruin us, and Huxley feared that what we love will ruin us. If you want to see how big this risk of disengagement and apathy is in Abraham's life, then I think you find it in what I will try to present to you as the real test of his life, the greatest moment of risk and vulnerability in his life. I told you I'd be reading from Genesis chapter 21. If you've got it, I want to start reading in verse 22. Of course, if you skim just a few lines before that, the thing you'll notice about this passage is it's a profound one. My Bible titles it, The Birth of Isaac. That long awaited for heir has finally come. And so it is we read about his birth and Abraham receiving him. And then in verse 22, we pick up in a new section titled The Treaty with Abimelech. Verse 22. At that time, Abimelech and Phocol, the commander of the army, said to Abraham, God is with you in all that you do. Now therefore swear to me here by God that you will not deal falsely with me or with my descendants or with my posterity. But as I have dealt kindly with you, so you will deal with me and with the land where you have sojourned. And Abraham said, I will swear. When Abraham reproved Abimelech about a well of water that Abimelech's servants had seized, Abimelech said, I do not know his, who has done this thing. You do not, did not tell me, and I have not heard of it until today. So Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them to Abimelech, and the two men made a covenant. Abraham set, sent seven ewe lambs of the flock, and Abimelech said to Abraham, What is the meaning of these seven ewe lambs that you have set apart? He said, These seven ewe lambs you will take from my hand, that this may be a witness for me that I dug this well. Therefore that place was called Beersheba, because there both of them swore an oath. So they made a covenant at Beersheba. Then Abimelech and Phocol, the commander of his army, rose up and returned to the land of the Philistines. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God, and Abraham sojourned many days in the land of the Philistines. Now stop there. That sounds to me like the ending of a story. The end would be the next line. In this one chapter, everything Abraham has been in search of is fulfilled. Isaac is finally born to him. He signs peace treaties with those he has previously been at war with. He negotiates and now has this land with this well that is his own. And a kind of concluding image is he plants a tamarisk tree in Beersheba. You can't help but imagine the old man sitting in the shade, watching his son Isaac play by that well, finally being in a place of peace, prosperity. We know that he is rich. We know that his son is finally there. For as complicated as things like Hagar and Ishmael have been, God is now watching out for them and they've left. Things have settled down and become quiet. And here he is in what we might imagine the end of his story. This is, after all, the part of Genesis that's about the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Isaac has been born. We would imagine that you read this final line, turn the page, and what would you discover? It's now Isaac's story. We pick up with the next promised heir that had been so long awaited. But instead, turn the page, or look down at the next line, depending on how it's laid out, and you read those famous words of Genesis chapter 22. After these things, God tested Abraham. If you go on reading, you'll be familiar with the passage. It's one of the most famous from Abraham's story, in which he calls Abraham to take his son and prepare him as a sacrifice on a mountain he will show him. That had to be a startling thing for Abraham to have experienced, and the narrator here seems to set it up for us in such a way that it startles us. Just when we imagine the story has ended, when everything has been neatly tied up, when every promise has been finally fulfilled, God tests Abraham. Has Abraham not been tested enough by this point? He's left everything, faced all kinds of dangers and challenges, waited and waited and waited for a son to be born. Surely he has passed that test time and time again, but here when everything is finally fulfilled, God tests Abraham. 
I want to suggest to you that this moment might have been one of the most dangerous moments of Abraham's life. It sure doesn't look that way. He's sitting in peace and prosperity. But what does Abraham have to have faith for at this point? He certainly still has it. He believes in God. If you said, do you have faith in God? I imagine the answer would be yes. But what is it in his life that is keeping that faith alive, that's keeping it active? He has everything he's ever needed faith for. It's also interesting that this test that God lays out before Abraham is not what we would imagine a test being a kind of true or false. All right, Abraham, here's the test. Multiple choice. Pick the right answer. You'll get a grade at the end. Instead, there's a kind of ambiguity to the language that God gives. He tells Abraham to prepare Isaac as a sacrifice. Well, what does it mean to prepare him as a sacrifice? Does it mean simply take him to the mountain? Does it mean set him on the altar on that mountain? Does it mean lift the knife above? Or does it actually mean slay him, make him the offering? The book of Hebrews highlights the fact that this ambiguity put Abraham in a particular kind of test. The book of Hebrews says, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. Now, what's always struck me about that passage is the word even. It wasn't this test, I want you to sacrifice Isaac and then I will raise him from the dead. So I trusted God would raise him from the dead. Instead, Abraham gets this call, prepare him as a sacrifice. And so he moves not knowing if or when or how God will intervene, believing that even if it should go so far as to take his son's life, still God might act by raising him, resurrection. What this test is that's before Abraham is the kind of test that compels him back into that ambiguity that complexity of life, the complexity that we can't control nor entirely understand, that forces our faith to be awake and active and real. The truth is there are complicated things all of us face in life, things we're waiting on, things we struggle to understand, things we once thought we had under control that suddenly aren't. Like Abraham, we find ourselves entering into that ambiguity, into that complexity, not knowing how or when or what it will look like for God to act, but holding on to that word, even. Even if it should be the worst I could imagine, still God is possible somehow, some way of bringing good, of bringing life. I think what God does in that moment, this test for Abraham, when everything seemed to finally be wrapped up, was force Abraham back into the life of faith. In some ways, he made Abraham himself again. Abraham had always been characterized by the kind of faith that was willing to live in that even ambiguity. Go to a place that I have not yet shown you. Even if God should send me halfway around the world, I'll keep following. Prepare your son as a sacrifice. Even if I should take his life, God could raise him from the dead. That even is a way of faith being alive and active, compelling Abraham into the uncertainty of the moment. There's an intentional check, as we've talked about each week, that I want to offer you for beginning to recognize how this instinct is at work within you. If you resonate with this possibility of apathy, perhaps it is I've retreated to my hobbies, perhaps it is I've retreated to what I control, Perhaps it is I've gotten comfortable with everything I once wanted now being firmly in my grasp. Then I think the question before you is the same question of sacrifice. The ability to sacrifice tests our ability to live by faith, to enter into a kind of ambiguity and a complexity that depends on God acting, perhaps in ways we don't fully understand. So James could famously write, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, tests of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. It's when your faith is tested that it stays alive, that you remain steadfast in that faith. But when faith is no longer tested, when there's no personal sacrifice, no need for sacrifice, but everything is neatly controlled, 
Well, that's the very moment that faith begins to falter. Lewis says it in a way about writing uh, the definition of love that I think equally applies and is equally true for faith, faith, hope, and love. Lewis writes this, to love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything in your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly be broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one, not even to an animal. Wrap it carefully round with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. And so it is too with faith. To have faith is to be vulnerable. To have faith is the certainty of having it tested and wrung and possibly broken. If you want to keep your faith intact, you can try never taking risks, never sacrificing, never putting yourself in a moment of vulnerability, but be sure your faith will change in that moment. It will become the kind that is hardened, the kind that is unbreakable and impenetrable and irredeemable. I want to offer to you the intentional practice of sacrifice as a way of rescuing yourself from that apathy. Paul calls us to offer our lives as a living sacrifice. That is, we're constantly placing ourselves before the Lord on an altar. God, what is it you would have me give? What is it you would have me sacrifice and give up? What is it that you're calling me into that I may not understand, that may take from me my comfort or my peace or my security? Let me be really clear about it this way. Disengagement is not necessarily a sin. There are things called vacation that we all enjoy. There are things like retirement, which I think God blesses and is the fruit of hard work. But if you are allowing yourself to become obsessive about controlling your control, disengaging anything that you can't protect and keep and control, retreating from life into anything that would require sacrifice, then there's a good chance that that disengagement is becoming something destructive, leaving you vulnerable and testing whether that faith is steadfast. None of us should be naive about how easily and naturally we begin to disengage and protect even the smallest things in life, to carve out our own life for ourselves. My goal is not for any of us to feel scolded by that kind of recommendation, but to recognize that you need to be rescued from it. In the end, I think the test that God gave Abraham was not a test to try to make him prove himself. Certainly, Abraham had proved himself so many times. This test was a way of God rescuing Abraham, keeping Abraham alive, preserving his faith, that hallmark characteristic of who he was. There are plenty of places in the Bible, in the world for that matter, that men do harm by things like aggression and violence. But by my reading of the Bible, my observations, there are just as many, if not more, that are damaged by apathy and disengagement. Families, communities, society, falling apart because we refuse to take on the complexity and the uncertainty of those challenges. You are here because God wants to use you. You're still alive because God is doing something in your life. And at times, just when you think you have it all nailed down and firmly in your control and it's peace and comfort from this day forward, God is prone to test it, not to ruin you, but to make that faith alive again and steadfast, to keep you turning to him and recognizing what it is he is doing. One of my favorite stories or ways of depicting this is from the story of Hannah Arendt. If you know her, she was a Jewish journalist, wrote for the New Yorker in the 1960s, and she's famous for a particular trial that she covered. Um, there was a movie in 2018 called Operation Finale. If you heard of it, it told the story of a secret Israeli operation to capture a man named Adolf Eichmann. Eichmann was a former SS official in Nazi Germany who had been one of the organizers of the final solution. And he had helped plan, literally orchestrate trains and logistics for those Jews traveling to concentration camps. It was discovered that he had fled Germany after the war and was living now in South America. And so an operation was put together. The Israelis captured him and brought him back to Jerusalem for a trial. It was billed as the trial of the century. And in many ways, for many people, it was the first time on television they had ever seen a trial, a public trial, of someone of his rank 
or involvement in the war. The movie that depicts this operation is full of suspense. It's an action movie, disguises and secret plots and undercover espionage, the risk of violent defeat as they attempt these maneuvers. But maybe the best part is the depiction of Eichmann himself. As the movie unfolds, this appalling image of a man who's credited with the deaths of millions of people, it gives way to an unremarkable image of a mere human, one which, as they have him in captivity, must be fed and shaved and repeatedly led to the bathroom, blind without his glasses and helpless. Scene by scene, the movie depicts Eichmann as more and more human and less and less the animal he is imagined to be. Now, that realization is not to his defense or his credit. The realization that one of the century's most grotesque villains was actually a quite normal human being need not diminish the man's guilt. His humanity isn't a defense, but it suggests something far more uncom uncomfortable for most of us. The most horrific acts of evil can be carried out by people indiscernibly different from you and me. Far from animals, Eichmann was a boring bureaucrat who justified horrific violence and acts simply by carrying out orders, his defense when he was tried. It's this blind and thoughtless loyalty that is often what we imagine evil, but what Hannah Eichmann coined a famous term, the banality of evil. If you know that word, banal simply means boring, so lacking in originality as to be obvious and boring. What Arendt observed when she went and saw Eichmann on trial in person was that evil, the kind of evil that he had per per uh, perpetrated, feeds not just on extremism, not just on evil villains, but just as frequently on the apathy of ordinary human beings. Sin works its way deepest into the most boring of lives, not just the most grand. And those who live passive lives, she wrote, were most susceptible to it. Arendt in her reporting put it this way, the sad truth of the matter is that most evil is done by people who never make up their minds to be or do either evil or good. Those who imagine they can avoid the complexity, sidestep what they can't control, just follow orders and not really think too hard, that those are the very lives where so often destruction and evil can wreak its worst havoc. The reason I bring up apathy, I'm a pastor after all, it's easy for you to hear me say apathy's bad because I want people in church on Sunday mornings, tithing, showing up, volunteering, but it's something far more important than that. Apathy is not dangerous because it just simply limits our participation or action. Apathy is dangerous because having neglected this testing of faith, having refused to make sacrifices, it becomes banal, our lives become boring, and we become unable, perhaps unwilling, to distinguish between what is good and what is evil. We become unable to act at all, and so by it we become a kind of destruction to ourselves and so many of the people around us. It's hard to recognize it, but this moment is very real for Abraham at the end of that chapter, when everything is his, when everything is comfortable, when he may believe in God, but really what need is there for faith now that everything has been fulfilled. And so it is God tests him to wake him back up so that we might get great passages like that one in Hebrews that he lived by faith and acted by faith, believing God was able even through resurrection to raise up his son. So the question for all of us is, are we willing to sacrifice? Are we sacrificing? Is there something complicated in your life that you would sure rather avoid or not deal with but if you were really honest before God, he may be asking you to step into an ambiguity, a complexity, a difficulty, not knowing exactly what God will do or how he will do it, but believing even in something this out of your control, God is capable of working. Are you willing to sacrifice some comfort? Are you willing to sacrifice the simplicity of the life that you've worked so hard to build for yourself? Because in the end, it's not just that person who needs the sacrifice, it's your faith that needs that sacrifice to stay awake. We read from Hebrews to talk about Abraham, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us too 
Lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. In the end, is it not Christ himself who makes this sacrifice? Christ himself who sets aside the comfort and the luxury and the protection of heaven and comes taking on that word even, even if it should be a cross, even if it should be death, not my will be done, but your will be done. And so by it is vindicated and receives, we don't associate this word with tests, but it's come up a couple times now, joy. That the great joy of life is that willingness to sacrifice and be tested and discover that faith still alive, that God's still at work, miracles still possible by his grace, by his mercy. I want to close in prayer. Uh, we'll do some Q&A. You always do a great job with that. It's one of my favorite segments, but I think the natural thing for us to do is to pray. Heavenly Father, I think most of us here, myself included, understand how easy it is to become apathetic and to disengage. God, there's so much about life right now that feels out of our control. Whether it's the news headlines that are breaking or the complexity of our own children or grandchildren's lives or neighbors that we no longer understand or jobs that feel changing too rapidly. God, even when it's in our own lives, things that we would just prefer not deal with anymore or pay attention to, it's so easy for us to turn our attention away from them and to grow apathetic. God, we're grateful that by your wisdom and grace, you test us. You don't let us slip into that apathy, but you bring along situations by which you pull our faith back into life, that you ask us to make sacrifices, testing us and calling us forth to a better steadfast faith. So we pray that your spirit would just speak clear to us this evening and the days to come. God, if we are succumbing to this apathy, wake us up from it. If there are things you are asking of us that we would prefer not to engage, God, give us the courage to do it. And let us see that before us is joy, a greater joy. That as you gave your life for us, that so too by taking up our cross and sacrificing, we participate in something bigger than ourselves and receive by it not only that steadfastness, but a greater hope and a greater joy than all the comforts of our own life could ever produce. We pray, God, you would just keep us alive to you, keep our faith alive, keep our faith active, and let us serve you well, sacrificing where you lead us to do it, that we might be in the end like Abraham, one defined by faith, who lived by faith, who demonstrated faith, who became a patriarch of faith for all of those generations to come. It's in your name we pray. Amen. If you've got questions, I always love doing a little discussion. This is the time for it. I'd be happy to hear some questions and we can talk. Apathy. Maybe this one hit a little too close at home. We need a few more moments, so. All right, well, let me in this way. I'm happy if you have questions, please put your hand up. I'm happy to hear them. So we've, yeah, good. I, uh was required to pretend I was John Wimber for a class at the seminary and answer questions as if I were him. It was an interesting study because I had to be him for a while. <clears throat> but I recently read an article about him after he passed several years ago that uh, he didn't have any great big name come over him and pray for him so far as a healing ministry. Didn't have a Catherine Kuhlman or someone else come and pray for him. And someone asked him, well, why do you do it? He says, because it's in the book. And he would, he said, my responsibility is to pray and be obedient. And I kind of wonder if, if in the apathetic mindset, in the spirit of apathy, that sometimes we miss the nudge to do what we're supposed to do. And I wrote down uh, that we don't, sometimes we don't step forward if the spirit nudges us to do something or to speak to someone. And I don't wanna be apathetic in those things. 
I want to be able to listen to the voice of God as, as Abraham did. He said, Abraham, Lord, here I am. But I want to be able to hear the voice of God nudging me along to do something for him. And my question, I, get, I don't know if I really have a question in there, Chase, um, because I'm, I, I, I'm concerned for the church that we, we become this, have this instinct of apathy that overrides everything. Yeah. And uh, uh, how can we encourage, here I'll come up with a question. How can we encourage our other brothers and sisters along the way on this journey that we're in? I'm in the journey class, here's my teacher right here. That we, that we can nudge each other along without being offensive and nudge them out of that apathetic mentality. Yeah, I think you answered the question yourself in a really profound way. Maybe the thing that's remarkable about Abraham in this moment is even when he has everything, he still apparently is listening because he hears when God says, take your son Isaac, your only son, go to the mountain, I'll show you. Uh, he still hears that and he obeys. So, and that's the hard part of all these chapters, if I could. The hard part of them is there's a way for you to mishear what I'm saying on all of these, right? That somehow I can never have an ambition or I could never go on an adventure vacation because we talked about adventure being bad. Or in this case, I could never have a moment of relaxation. I could never have a retirement account. I could never, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is these things can tempt us to do exactly what you're warning. They can, become a, they can become so comfortable to us that we're incapable of stepping out of them into something that God's called us to that's more complicated. And I think the thing that you said that I, hit me as profound is just at a bare minimum what keeps that from happening is us being willing to listen, us actively listening. Is there something that may be good and right and hard earned and won and deserved, but God, you're asking me to sacrifice something of it for something you want to do, some test before me that keeps my faith alive. So I think listening is an important one. Yeah, I think that was a good question and an answer. Any other questions? Yep. I'm curious, Chase, is um, kids of parents that are in this stage of apathy, I was thinking of my dad, and I certainly don't want to speak for him, but I can speak for myself. Um, where um, as a retired man, he's looking for any way to help, any way to fix something or loves it when I bring my problems to him. And, and I think probably as a growing adult, I have added to a temptation for him to become apathetic because I wanna do it myself. I don't want help, I don't want, you know, and I just, I wanted to grow up. I just really did. And so I'm curious now that, I mean, I love his insight and I love him wanting to help, but do you have any suggestions for the kids of the parents that are in this stage on how we can help them and maybe open ourselves up or encourage them in certain ways to keep that faith alive and stay open but not sound like parents ourselves to our parents. Yeah, I would say for myself, like it's easy for me to look at somebody else's apathy and not recognize my own as well. Sometimes I just avoid complexity of personal relationships too. Like I'd rather just do it myself because there's some complexity there I just would rather avoid. Just let me do everything, right? So part of this is just being willing to step into complexity if it is the thing the Lord is leading us into. Um, I think in general, I mean, I'll speak broadly. I think, and Central is a good, I think an example of a church that's done so well. I mean, for my own time here at Central, I think it's been true. But making sure that all generations have a place is I think really, really important. And we have to, all generations have to be intentional about that too, right? We have to value each other and recognize the value that each other brings um, and create those opportunities. Because I know I, we live in a culture and a time where youth is celebrated, you know, the younger you are, the, the more cachet you have in culture and the, the, the better opportunities that may seem presented to you. And we also live at a time where I have a lot of sympathy. I'm, I'm 
30, 35, but I'm already finding myself feeling like some new technology comes out and I'm like, ah, I know how I do it. I don't need that, right? So I understand that it is a hard world because everything is constantly becoming so complicated and hard to keep up with. And in our desire to keep up with culture, I do worry sometimes that we push people out simply because they're not on the cutting edge of what we imagine. So the church being the kind of place that we model that, the home also the kind of place where we recognize there's deep value for what every generation brings. Um, it's something we probably all just have to keep trying to figure out. Yeah, right back there. Uh, so building off of uh, C.S. Lewis quotes. Um, there was a lot there, of them in there. I warned you week one there was going to be a lot of C.S. Lewis quotes. So. Well, I just got in town now, so uh, this is my <laughs> first one to hear. But um, I uh, have read a lot on C.S. Lewis, and definitely this uh, apathy definitely reminds me of the screw tape letters, how uh, specifically the chapter and the metaphor of the troughs and the valleys, and um, how just as much we are more guided and learn the nature of God when we are in the lowest points of life than whenever uh, Satan allows us to be up in this upper part and just content to ignore everything and be ignored as long as we're content and happy with what we're doing because in those moments we just forget that why we need God yeah yeah that's what we talked in week one about reading these biblical stories as companions instead of just heroes if you were here for that that it's easy to read them as heroes and then what do you do you fixate on the high points the things they get right or maybe the low points the things they get wrong what you miss is just that kind of <laughs> churn of life in between those moments, right? And I actually think the Bible's particularly good. If you ever read stories and you're like, this is really boring, sometimes that's the, the point of the story, right? Sometimes the part of the story is, this is life. Like there's, I think there's several books. I think the end of the book of Judges gets boring because that's kind of the point. Like the more you sin, the more things just fall apart and don't make sense. Sometimes that's the lived experience and it's true of these biblical characters as well too. And so part of, I think, what scripture is such a gift is to make that same point you do as well too, that, um, God is at work doing things in our lives in high points. He's at work doing things in our life at low points. And he's at work in our lives doing things when we're sitting in the shade tree, imagining that everything's just kind of okay, right? Even those moments, God is doing and acting as well. So, yeah, great. Yeah, right in the back row. I, was, I read your book, the chapter this week. Oh, thank you. And, and uh, you said something that I wanted to have you clarified a little bit sure I'm gonna start it says biblically uh, biblical faith is always proven through sacrifice faith must let go as easy as it hangs on as P uh, Peterson put it the test is conducted by means of sacrifice it always this way in fact it is best this way the greatest evidence of faith is not what we receive but what we can afford to lose that's the part I'd like you to clarify a little bit, what we can afford to lose. Sure. It goes on, let me just, so you have a context as well. Sacrifice forces us out of our complacency and apathy in ways re receiving tends not to. It doesn't require action to wish for something, but faith that can be tested is willing to make the sacrifice. Yeah, well, so let me be very clear at the front we are saved by Christ's sacrifice. So there's no sense of our own willingness to sacrifice that's salvific, that's leading to our salvation. But over and over you get this drumbeat that when you receive Christ, you take up your cross, that you deny yourself. As I read earlier, Paul's willingness to be, become a living sacrifice. That when Christ becomes Lord, I say to him, there's no part of my life that is not surrendered to you. There's nothing you can't ask of me that I'm unwilling to give to you. Uh, and it is easy for faith to turn into an accumulation of things. And certainly, faith oftentimes, we have the riches of God's grace poured out over us. We have this great joy and peace. I mean, in the end, I think we're net positive no matter what sacrifice we do make in life. But often those things are acquired through the testing of faith, that it's when we're tested or persecuted uh, that that faith becomes real and that joy becomes ours and it becomes steadfast. So, yeah, I, I always worry if there's something in my life that I would be unwilling to sacrifice for God. If I've drawn lines in my life saying, okay, I'll do this, God, but I won't do that. 
I'm willing to sacrifice this, but I would never sacrifice that. doesn't mean God's going to ask you to. But any time within my life I'm drawing those lines to stay in control, then I, I, I'm really not living the kind of sacrificial, living sacrifice, Paul's language, kind of faith that I think Scripture calls us to. Everything is his. I die to self. Is that helpful, what I'm saying there? Yeah. It's easy, and part of what I'm trying to draw is a distinction. It's easy for us to define our faith by what we get. And I think often the challenge is faith is also defined by what we're willing to release, what we're willing to entrust to him, is the way I would say it. All right, well, thank you guys. Let me end this way, too. Um, I wrote in the book at one point, uh, perhaps, we said this week one, perhaps you are not a man. Uh, Hopefully the last four weeks have been helpful for you as a woman, too. I pointed out at the beginning, I think all of these are applicable to women. I wanted to have this conversation with men particularly. Uh, But also I wrote in the book, perhaps you think none of these instincts are real. You've got totally different instincts. Great, I'm totally fine with that. Uh, Really what we've been trying to do over the last four weeks and what the book tries to do is say, how do you take a closer look at what's going on in your life? And how do you see what you have in Christ as a way of maturing and checking that into something valuable? So perhaps it's not adventure or ambition or reputation or apathy, but some other thing that by the Spirit's guidance you've discerned within your life. Um, if, If the book or these conversations have been helpful in any way to do that, and then to begin to mature that through Christ into something better, then that's really what we've been all after from the very beginning, the sort of message beneath the message. And it's really been such a privilege, uh, great conversations. Thank you so much for questions and afterwards as well, too. I'm just really grateful for the opportunity. And I think Pastor Jim's coming up now. So he's the closer. That's always the best. Let's express our appreciation to Chase. My friend. Uh, we, we thank you, Chase, for being a part of our growing, our life, to have something as brilliantly thoughtful and deep and kind of life-exposing that you've done for us, just giving us handles for processing what's going on inside of us as men and, and as women. Who have to, some of you have to live with men, and uh, all of us have to negotiate a world with men. And thank you, ladies, for being a part of this as well. Chase uh, has been a good friend for years, and um, I really love, admire, and appreciate you, and we do here at Central. We're so grateful for the church you started at Ben Oak and the way it's prospering and your life as a pastor and as a writer. Your book is doing great, and uh, I enjoyed uh, Some of you may have seen him on 700 Club last Friday morning. Um, being interviewed, did a great job, and I watched you on today's show, that was awesome, your interview, so may God just keep putting a covering. I think just before we go, I'd love to have us all pray, just pray for Chase, and just the doors God's opening up for him, the influence he's giving him, and we're just proud of you and grateful for you, and uh, may God keep your heart as well. When I'm with young leaders, I say, some of you are going to get really hurt, and uh, The worst thing, you know, they say a trial will make you bitter or better. I think there's a worse alternative, and it's what you've talked about today, that you get to a place you just don't care anymore. And uh, I never want to come to, even with aging, I don't want to come to that place where I just don't care. And uh, we pray God keeps your heart from never becoming that and always stays on the edge, always taking risks, um, always uh, putting your gift out there for us. And I know it's a sacrifice for you to do that, but we are grateful for it. Uh, Chase has a wonderful podcast. It's quite popular. It's called the Pastor Writer Podcast. And it's a weekly podcast. It's usually 45 to 55 minutes. And he interviews a lot of the top writers in our country and beyond. And uh, he's a he's brilliant, engaging, really great writers. And then, and then he has to um, take a step down and and we do a weekly podcast. We do, we do which is your favorite. Yes, right, of course. <laughs> and um, we, we do a weekly podcast. It's called the Jim Bradford Podcast. So it's really on leadership. And right now we're going verse by verse through Second Timothy, Paul's coaching of a young pastoral leader. And uh, I, when I travel, people say to me, oh, you know, we, we listen to your podcast all the time, et cetera. And, and then they sometimes make me feel like they like the interviewer better than anything I have to say, because he's so insightful in the way he captures comments and, and, and concepts and then 
guides our conversation. It's really great. So uh, you can find that podcast through the centralassembly.org website. But uh, look up past on the, all the podcast platforms. Pastor Writer is a great podcast. So thank you for the contribution you're making. I want to. I want you to just come stand here, and uh, maybe a few of you guys could just come and let's stand around Chase and let's pray for him. Let's all stand together. And, um, reach out your maybe your hand, or if any of you'd like to come up, gather around him. We'll do that. But Father, we're grateful for uh, this friend. Um, he has been such a part of who we are as a church over the years. We thank you for all the way he served as a volunteer, as a staff member. We thank you for Ashley, his wife, his kids. We thank you, Lord, for this wonderful family and for this man of God. I pray you'll keep his heart. I pray, Lord, that even the things we address tonight will never become, in a destructive way, a part of his heart. But his, he will continually be living on that edge of sacrifice and taking risks. I pray that especially you protect his heart as, um, as, as, his, as his profile grows, as more and more people follow what he does, what he says, even on a national level and international level. I just pray, Lord, that your grace and favor will be upon him in a powerful way. And that, Lord, you will give him the kind of favor that will cause his influence to multiply. And as it does, that his heart would just stay with that great heart we know him to have and his, his humility and his love for you. Keep his mind sharp and active and keep opening doors for him to go deeper and for him to go wider in his influence and, and keep the center of his life to glorify Jesus and see your church built. So we thank you for this. Bless him. We thank you for this gift of a friend and a man of God. And thank you for all he's imparted to us these last four Wednesday nights. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's express our appreciation to him one more time. And God bless you all. It's been great to be with you and great to see you again.